Welcome to a shopping centre in Shepherd's Bush, a shopping centre that has come to a standstill because boxing, big time boxing is here. Anthony Joshua, Jermaine Franklin in the heavyweight division, live on Five Live Sport at 10 o'clock tomorrow night. This is where it's going to happen. The weigh-in is on the way. The great and good of boxing are here. We're going to speak to as many of them as we possibly can. I'm Darren Fletcher and this is Five Live Boxing. So welcome along to the programme. Steve Bunce and George Groves are here. Bunce, one thing we've got to do is what you do on the famous pods after the fight. We've got to grab as many people as we possibly can. I'm going to try and help you, but you've got to lead the way. I mean, this is chaos. This is mayhem. But this is wonderful. This is the heavyweight division. And this is the Anthony Joshua business. It is indeed the Anthony Joshua business. And you're absolutely right. It is chaos and it is mayhem trying to get hold of people. And I'm going to warn you, Fletch. You have heard and you like the pods where I get six voices. You've never heard the ones where I get no voices. It could happen in this mayhem and this chaos. Who knows who we get? There are dozens of people here we could choose from. Let's hope we get some of them. And what it does feel like, and I know George is issuing to come in, what it feels like, it feels like a big event. It feels proper. It feels like a big time event. It does, doesn't it, George? No, it does. I mean, there's, it's packed here now. I've been here early. Obviously, Westfields is my hometown. I, I like to linger. I thought I'd get here early today. And it had a little... When it was empty and they were setting up the stage, it did have that sort of German undercard sort of feel, shopping centre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But now you can't move. We can barely get into the uh, the atrium here at the, at the West Hills. There are thousands of people on the three stories on the balconies leaning over, Fletch. There are literally thousands and thousands of people all the way around. Let, let's set the scene, because when I walked in today, it was like walking into any old shopping centre. All the shops are open, and then you walk around the corner, you go down kind of one of the little streets that are inside, and there, there's this stage that's been erected in the middle, and everybody has stopped to watch. You've just said that, Steve. We've got an escalator to the left. You can go to the top level, and that, that's where you get the best view. But down at floor level, where we are, you can barely move. But at the same time, the shopping centre is just going about its everyday business. Some shoppers are walking past with more bags than my wife has when she goes to the January sales. And they're walking past, looking at us, thinking, what on earth are you doing here? Yeah, but here's the thing, half of them are stopping. And that's why we have these in shopping centres and not behind closed doors in gymnasiums. In here today, there's probably half the people who are watching came specifically for it. The other half, and it's growing, it's people with three or four bags. And by the way, George, don't listen to him, my wife, my wife. He's already got three or four bags here. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> he's got three or four bags. He's got expensive trainers. He's got all sorts of stuff. A little bit of jewellery he's bought. He's been properly shopping the Fletch. I may have shopped him now to his partner, to his wife, but he's been shopping. Completely out of order. Completely unnecessary. Completely true. Um, <laughs> this feels big. Steve's right. And isn't it great having Anthony Joshua back? No, it is, it is. He's, he's been a big name in the sport for so long now. We just, well, I think we can just see him now. Or, we can, uh, actually. Oh, just the the queue for Nando's. If, but... if we look to our left-hand side, there was a jewellery shop, and, and AJ stood right in front of it in a grey hoodie with the hood up, uh, and he's being swarmed by passers-by. He thought, if I stick the hood up, nobody's going to realise it's me, how wrong he is. Everybody's around him. And by the way, he's quite relaxed. He's having pictures taken. He seems OK. But this is a massive weekend for him, massive night for him tomorrow night. It's a massive night for him, and it's been a massive week for him, and it's been a massive two months for him. And if you want to know the honest truth, Fletch, it's been a ma massive three or four years for him. Since that night, since that when he was stopped by Andy Ruiz in 2019, in June, at Madison Square Garden, absolutely sold out. That was the fight that was launching him in America. It went the wrong way. Since then, it's been about regaining titles, losing his way, aiming for redemption, losing his way. And we find ourselves here nearly in April of 2023, when my mind in many ways is still back ringside 2019 in June. Look at AJ, he's doing what AJ used to do. He's speaking and talking. He'll, he'll kiss 500 babies today. He's got that big beaming smile on his face as well. And, and looking at this, George, he's as popular as ever. I think this is his comfort zone, Joshua. Do you it know is I mean? his comfort zone, you're absolutely you right, You know, George. there's a lot of fighters who can't do this, you know, fight week. They can't have the interaction. What were you like? Well, I was like, uh, you know, you'd want a bit of interaction, but enough was enough. Whereas Joshua just does above and beyond any other fighter would do. Yeah. So I think if he came here today and didn't have that, that might have even thrown him off. You know, I mean, there has been this ripple throughout the industry that Joshua's not quite as big a draw as he has been before. And that this fight is no one, people Absolute don't rubbish. care quite the same. But they've stuck it here at Westfields. And as you say, it, it's packed. So he's going to come out to a lot of faces, you know, and he's already been swamped now for his attention. 
uh, I think it's the right thing for him. So Anthony Joshua has made his way onto the stage, white baseball cap, grey hooded top, black tracksuit bottoms, white trainers. Early impression, Steve. He looks a million dollars to me. He looks like he is. He's relaxed, he's a focused, he's a seasoned. He's a heavyweight that's been there before, which doesn't mean he's too relaxed. It just means he's been there, he's done it. He's just doing it again. George, when we saw him arrive and he was having photographs with the public, etc., the big beam in Joshua's smile was there. But he's got the business face on now. Yeah, no, definitely. You can't get away from that. I'm afraid at the West Hills, you're going to make your way to this atrium in the middle. He's going to be swarmed. But yeah, he looks like, you know, nothing nothing glaring. You know, you're looking, you want to see, is there anything tight? Is there anything nervous about him? But he looks cool, he looks calm, he looks comfortable. What I would say, you might hear someone scream from time to time. I think that's a member, member of Jermaine Franklin's family who's about five, five metres from us and she can make herself heard, Steve. She can indeed. It's really interesting. Just quickly, Fletch. There's AJ getting on the scales now and then I'll tell you about Jermaine's weight. David Diamante will tell us the weight. 255.4 for AJ, 255.4 for Anthony Joshua. That's the first time he's been over 250 pounds since the Klitschko fight. Yeah, so we were, we were looking at his waist and thinking he looked slim. Well, he's bulked up, maybe he's chopping, chopping the trees and doing that stuff. Steve, he was 244 in the Usyk 2, 237 the second time he fought Ruiz. Far too light. 250 against Klitschko and he's heavier than that for this and one. And Jermaine Franklin, importantly, he told me on Monday I'll be 23 pounds lighter. And guess what? He's 23 pounds lighter. Yeah, 257 he was against and, Dillian and, White. And 234 today. That's, that's incredible for a heavyweight to give you a prediction. Controlled his eating for seven days and come in exactly. That's weird, George. That's weird. Here we go. The face off. And there's not even a flicker on the face of Anthony Joshua. Still wearing the white baseball cap. And it's a long stare down between two men who are going to be toe to toe in the O2 live on Five Live Sport tomorrow night. George. I think it makes sense to me that Joshua is coming in a little bit heavier uh, for the fight that you anticipate him to have. It makes sense for him to be heavier than he was for, say, Usyk, who's much more lighter on his toes. Um, obviously, naturally getting heavier as he gets older, but always looks in phenomenal shape. There's a couple of women here that are with Jermaine Franklin. They're standing up squealing and squealing. You might be able to hear them screaming and squealing. They've got sweatshirts on that say, we ain't come all this way to hug. There they are in front of you. And you know, and Jermaine Franklin, because he was accused of doing a bit of hugging against Dillian White. Well, that, that, those sweatshirts and those two women tell you, we ain't come all this way to hug. Eddie Hearns just jumping off the stage to come and join us. Anthony Joshua has just been having some pictures. He looks as relaxed as anything. Eddie. Hey, mate. How are you? I'm good, a bit nervous, but I like what I saw up there. I mean, it's a different kind of AJ. Yeah. You know, it wasn't really too friendly in the interview and you know the face-to-face the -face was a little bit uh, intense but I like what I see heavier 11 pound heavier than the Usyk fight I think he's coming with size in this fight to, to try and do a job on Jermaine Franklin I think we were saying it's the first time he's over 250 since Klitschko at Wembley yeah um, I think he's sort of uh, explored many different things in his career you know oh my, my engine might not be good enough so maybe I need to come in leaner you know or in this fight I need to be heavier and I just think you know, a lot's made of the way. I don't think he's training in camp, weighing himself every day. It's just he's, he is where he is. This camp's been a lot about output in sparring and punches thrown with Derek James. And I think that's going to give him the confidence to empty his tank in rounds. Sometimes you've seen him over the last few years, you know, sort of go through the rounds, particularly against Pulev, and take his time to break him down. But I think if he senses an opportunity here, he'll be looking to take Franklin out. The turnout here today tells you he's as Amazing, popular yeah. as ever. Amazing. I mean, it's like, you know, when you've been away for a long time, like he has... And he's boxed internationally and he's been a little bit inactive. It's kind of like when you throw a birthday party and you hope everyone's going to turn up. And you sort of turn up to the Wayne and you start looking at the tiers here at Westfield. And it's completely full up. I mean, a massive turnout for him and sold out tomorrow night. You know, we say against James, Jermaine Franklin. Looks in good shape. He's going to be a lot lighter. I think he's going to be a lot fitter. Will he be as robust as he was with that, at that weight? you know, coming through the Dillian White fight. But I tell you, I've, I've seen a massive confidence in Jermaine Franklin this week. And he his was, people. He was very timid in the Dillian White build-up. I don't think he felt, felt that he sort of deserved to be there. And I feel like that performance and also going through that process and those surroundings will really help him on Saturday night. Ed, you talked there about on the stage about it was a bit frosty, a little bit cold. And it's odd because 
we saw that AJ, we were 50 feet away, but we were also just out there when he arrived earlier on. And we saw him and he was doing that thing, the kissing the babies and the shaking yeah, yeah. and the selfies. And so what point between there and there and that 50 <laughs> meters did he transform into the man that got on the stage? Because that looked like the AJ, that was, a, that was an old AJ. Yeah. I know you take the mickey out of me for saying I've seen something in his eyes, but he looked, he looked mean there yeah, on the stage. Yeah, good, I want him to be mean. Oh, but, but when he finished being mean, he did then go, you're right, afterwards as well, go and have photos with everyone and be nice. So. I think he knows the pressures of Saturday night and also he probably can't ignore the fact that people are saying to him, be mean, be aggressive. And I said to him in camp, I said, you do realise when you, uh, you know, I'm the closest person to these two in the head-to-heads and I'm looking at AJ thinking, Jesus, like, I, I, I know Jermaine's a fighter, so, but I, I, you can't help but look at this guy and go, Whew, I don't fancy getting hit off this guy. And you know with the speed and the ferocity of the combinations, if he lets them go, I mean, it's, it's daunting. But he mustn't let Franklin gain confidence in this fight or get any kind of rhythm. I think he's got to be a nice, sharp and spiteful early on. What's your perfect outcome for tomorrow night? Just a Eddie. devastating knockout and a dominant performance. You know, I, I'd, like, I'd like to see him do some rounds because I think under Derek, you see, the problem is now, if he goes in and chins this guy in three rounds, everyone's going to say, Fury next. Has to be Fury now or Wilder. Will you and be saying it? Probably, because <laughs> we can make the most money out of that one, George, you know. Like, but on a serious note, I do feel like he deserves the opportunity to gel with Derek James, do you know what I mean, over a course of fights. But the problem is, it's like in heavyweight boxing, everything's about timing. And you look at the situation with Usyk and Fury falling out, Fury doesn't have an opponent, he doesn't have a mandatory, he's going to be looking for a fight in the summer. So yeah, yeah. what, you know, but listen, we've been there before, and, and, and it all comes down to the performance on Saturday. If he wins but wins unconvincingly. I feel like he really needs that, that summer fight. Could be a Dillian White or something like that. If he looks fantastic and does some rounds, I think he'll be calling for that big fight as well. But, you know, if he loses, it's a different conversation and it could be the end of the road. If you put it into perspective as well, he's trying to do something here, but not many heavyweights have been able to do. Be at the top of the mountain, lose. Get back to the top again, lose twice, go again. This is rarefied air. If he can actually do it, then that probably gives him his own little place in heavyweight history because yeah, it's what? so Three rare for people to do it. Two times, it's rare for anyone to win a world heavyweight title. It'll, the, the, let alone win two of them, let yeah. alone win it three times. But I feel like when we talk about, you know, he was up here when, I mean, the Ruiz fight was a devastating defeat. He's a good fighter, Andy Ruiz, a top 10 heavyweight in the world. But the Usyk defeat, especially the second fight, I've tried to say to you, he was so disheartened by that loss. But I actually thought he boxed quite well. You know, I mean, one first fight with Robert Garcia, 115, 113 on most people's scorecards. After nine rounds, I thought he's going to win the fight, and Usyk was just amazing. So I still see him as an elite heavyweight in every sense of the word. I think with AJ, it's just more confidence. You know, and if he can get that confidence from, from uh, Derek, Derek James, because it's the same confidence that he had under Rob McCracken. One voice, complete trust. You know, you've been there before. Absolutely. Someone looks in your eyes in the corner and says, listen, do, and, and that was, you go back to like the end of the fifth round against Vladimir Klitschko. What's the job Rob McCracken done? AJ was gone. Yeah. And it was like, listen, breathe, look at me. And AJ's like, okay. When he believes in the game plan, when he knows what to do, he's really effective. And I'm hoping those two have gelled in camp and he can put that performance together tomorrow. Ed, on Saturday night, you'll be floating around the ringside. It's a, it's a decent, it's a good undercard. It's a fun night. AJ will have arrived. You're leaving for, the, for that little bit. At what point will you go in and what will you be looking for? I'm assuming now he's in his, he maybe got his boots on, he's maybe even got his bandages on. Will you be, what, will you be looking for signs, telltale signs? Because you've seen those signs before Ruiz, before Usyk, before Klitschko. What, what will you be looking for? Uh, Give us an insight yeah, to I've, what, I've what's given, good I've and what's bad. I've given up of guessing, really. Yeah. I mean, the one thing, the only fight... I mean, when I go back to the defeats and you start to think about what did you see, Ruiz fight, he weren't quite himself. New surroundings, had some medical problems as well in camp. I don't think his confidence was that high. His attention span wasn't great. And then I go to the Usyk one, and he was lost in tactics. He didn't have the belief of what to do or how to do it. And I go back to the way that AJ works is you can't go into him and give him false hopes and dreams. You can't go into him and go, listen, mate, go out there tonight and just stick it on him. Like everyone said about the Usyk fight, just stick it on him. AJ's, you know, deeper than that. How? In what, you know, what position, what, what should I be throwing? How should I go through the rounds? The second fight, he believed it more. I think this fight against, a, you know, a, a, an orthodox fighter like Jermaine Franklin, he can go out and just listen to Derek James. But I just want to see, I feel like he's, he's, He's tinkered too much in the past. But sometimes you go in, he watches a lot of stuff in the changing rooms. 
He won't hit as many pads. You know, he had a heavy bag in a changing room for the Usyk one fight, and he's seen that someone's done that in the, in the past. Just go back to basics. When he used to hit pads with McCracken, you know, I, used to, I walked in the changing room for the Vladimir Klitschko fight. I've never seen anything like it. I'm seeing him hit pads with McCracken, taking his deltoids off his sockets, and I'm thinking, Jesus, this guy is going to absolutely tear this man to part. I want to see that. I want to see him pumping with sweat in the changing room, firing on all cylinders, nice and loose, not too tense. Go out there and let his hands go and enjoy himself. Well, he's trained like Rocky Balboa, hasn't he, for this one? Yeah. Isolated conditions. He's gone back to basics. Let's hope he's a good night, Eddie. It's been a great fight week, and this has been brilliant today. All the best tomorrow night. Thanks Fingers for joining crossed. us. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. That's Eddie Hearn, the promoter. Um, I think we've waited long enough before we hear from the main man. Let's hear from Anthony Joshua. He sat down to speak in depth to Steve Bunce. AJ, thanks very much for sitting down. I'll ask you a simple question. Um, you're out in Dallas with Derek. When did you think I need to make a change, have a break, and change the, the structure, the setup, the training setup? When was it? Um, I would say 2018. Because you knew that you maybe what, what's, what word should we use? Going stale, needed something different, needed a change. What did? You, what was the word? It was a. I think it was a World Cup. I noticed it in the World Cup when Croatia beat a, one of the favourites. On the way to the final. On the way to the final. And I started seeing certain boxers beating other boxers and getting better. So I started saying, okay, cool. Why is that? Because information was now available due to socials and people showing what they do. So I realised competition was getting it, will, will, will catch up a lot quicker due to information being available now. So I just started realising that we need to broaden our horizons. If you want to conquer and maintain this level for a long time and be ahead of the curve, we need to kind of, like I said, like football, you have a throwing coach, you have a penalty coach, a free kick coach, so you have a team. So from then I just started realising we need to build um, our base if you want to conquer for a lot longer. So the, the concept, the idea that you're with one man and that man stays with you for a career, you think that might be fading in boxing? You think that might become obsolete as we go forward? Do you think there'll be guys like you having like 25 fights with, with one man in the future? Yeah, like people with their fathers, Mayweather done it, Tefimo Lopez, yeah, Tefimo Lopez, Devin Haney, like these guys, they... Tend but that's, to... that's a father-son thing. Uh, Javonte Davis? Yeah, okay, that's not a father-son, but, but it's a guy that saved him. And, Save, yeah. yeah cause, so it's a father figure, how about that? But what I was going to get to is that it's not just a one-man band. I, he works with a lot of different people. Devin Haney brings in different people to help build his son as well. So I saw those things. Like I always looked at Mike Tyson. He had uh, Cuss, Kevin Rooney, Teddy Atlas. I started seeing, okay, so there is like teams of trainers, people that work collectively together in order to achieve the goal. But yeah, I just sort of seeing that it's people who have gone really far in the sport. I'm not talking about Javante Davis, like he's mm. coming barely after me. But people from the past, as I said, like Mike Tyson and stuff, yeah, those guys had multiple trainers and... And over the over this last eighteen month period, yeah. when you've now you're about to have your third person in in your corner, do, do yeah. you have to do a lot of adjusting for that? Yeah, but the adjusting is about the connecting. Boxing, my style. No one's really going to tell me box at five foot eleven, start rolling, bobbing and weaving, neglect your attributes, and do something box self. Absolutely. So I'm not going to have to really change too much, right? When you look at me and my makeup, you look at the person's strengths, and a good coach will identify that. So yeah, I don't have to change too much, but what you do change is like the way you communicate with someone. You, you get to learn about how people are. Some people are reserved. Some people are, mm. you know, they're the type of things. And I think connecting with someone that you work with, imagine going to the office every day with someone that you just don't get along with. It. It's a nightmare. Yeah. And you go to the office with someone that you actually like, you have a little laugh with, you get along with, work can get done, the day goes by quick. So yeah, it, that's the thing. And did you connect with Derek Quick soon? Like, did you did you have a feeling like the first day? This is I'm quite I'm quite reserved, but Derek's cool, man. I mean, Derek kicked off, and he's like he's cool himself. He's reserved, but he's like open. I'm reserved, but I'm open. Yeah, we're we're quite similar, I say, in that sense. Mm. And are you looking forward to being in? Because you've always had a love for a trenches style fight. You've always wanted, you, you fancy that. Are you looking forward to being with Derek in a big fight, in a fight yeah. where, where you're going to need him for that 52 seconds, which is basically Real all talk. he's going to get? Real talk, yeah. yeah. It might be Saturday. It, it might, could be Saturday, yeah. You just you let's not underestimate anyone. It might be a mm. year from now. But when that happens, um, I trust Derek mm. and I trust his words, which is a great thing. Like, one of the things that is important for a fighter is to trust in your corner and listen to your coach. Total trust.
also you have to you have to trust in your own ability, mm. which he says he's like you got yourself here. Derek say you got yourself this far. Don't let me come and have to tell you what to do. You got to know what to do because when you're in that ring, you're on your own. So you've got to trust your ability, but also when you come back for that 30 seconds, a minute with me, there's things I see that I need you to trust me with. And I trust him. So I'm looking forward to that time. And there will just be the one voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I haven't even really spoken about it. It's just set up how it's it set is. set up, that's why, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I haven't really had to, before I've tried to do things off my own accordance because I've mm. seen ahead of the time the way things are going. But with, with where I'm at now, um, I joined a team that was already structured in that way. Now, I don't want to dwell on the past and roll over the past, but I'm going to have to for a second yep. because I sat down yesterday, or I sat down with Richie Woodall, yep. and we watched Usyk Joshua 2, yep. start to finish, yep. with no commentary. We okay. watched him. Have you done that? I've watched it, but no, nah, not with no commentary. Yeah, it was, it was good with no commentary. Well, I had Richie's commentary, which, of course, is brilliant because <laughs> he understands things. And Oh, and we, speaking to him. Yeah, you no, yeah, to the yeah, two of us yeah, together, yeah, yeah. We, we watched it. 36 minutes of our life that I don't, I, I, I'm glad I lost because it was class. It's actually 47. Yeah, well, I don't count the minutes, man. We, we ran through that. They were chaotic. <laughs> I'm joking. And we didn't do the post fight, by the way. Okay. It was boxing only. Yeah, exactly. That's what I expect. Forget about it. Of course, that. Though. Though. I, mean, I have forgotten about it. Don't worry. We just did boxing only. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you one thing I did know is me jumping up and down like a lunatic at ringside. Yeah. What side was you sitting? Right behind the judge that voted for you. The side it looked like I won. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Because yeah. I've got lots of stick for saying I thought you could have It's mad. Nicked a lot of people on that side yeah. said that. So it's not just you. A lot of. It's weird, but it's just. The view, I don't know what it was. I don't know. A few people from that side felt that same way. So half of them were my family, by the way. What 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 yeah, no, no, that's true. Yeah. It was it was the fa- it was the fam section, that's yeah. for sure. No, what what was what was what was amazing about it yeah. was just the the amount of times that Richie jumped up almost. He mm. said, Now! Yeah. Now the moments. The moments. The, the moments. The, 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 where you'd call him, you'd call him, or you'd set him up, you'd move back, and then you didn't. Yes, let let it go. Yes, well, that was hard. That was hard for me to watch. Yeah, yeah. Listen, if you want to, if you want to beat someone, I won't say like Usyk, but if you want to beat someone that's very good, you have to have everything in order, everything, physically, mentally, training camp, everything has to be in order. Because uh, those little times when it's like now yeah. are the times in training you need camp. Those when things it was to have like, been now. Yeah, every everything, and that's. Training camps are difficult. To get everything perfect is difficult. Yeah, no, listen, I, I'm, and I'm pleased. That that's a, I, well, as I expect, that's a straight, honest answer. Yeah, so, but, but I learn and I improve my training camps. Are all of these things lined up now? Yeah, just me. Just, I'm the final, final piece of the puzzle, right? Yeah. As I said, it's me that's got to go and do the job. And Franklin's been training in Florida. He's coming in 20-odd pounds lighter. He's focused. He's a good pro anyway. He's a, you know, he's a good operator. Mm, he, he, mm, he's a good pro. I know you can't look past him. What mm. are you expecting? What are you expecting when you walk out at the O2, your home, a place that people came to pay, well, respects to you during that great run, 2015, 2016? After, what are you expecting? I have to address that after the fight. Okay. What about you walking out? What are you expecting then? Can you allow yourself to imagine what it's going to be like walking out? You know, you've got that sense of noise. You've been in the tunnels there yeah. when it's sold out, AJ, and they're screaming for I you. I belong man. here. I want it. I want it. I want to be here. That's it. That's what I'm expecting is that feeling. I'm glad I'm here. This is where I want to be. That's it. Now, the last time I spoke to you, I told you, without a doubt, Usyk and Fury was definitely made. And you went, okay, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. And of course, since then, it's definitely not made. What did you think when you found out? What did you think? What was your gut feeling when you heard it had definitely gone? I believe it's not my position to slate and slag anyone off. I'm pretty sure that fight will happen because I feel that there could potentially be a method to the madness. And I think Usyk is representing himself well. He's and he, come out of it well. He's done, it, he's done his best to kind of give the fans what they want. If... Number one, I was in that position. I didn't take the fight. How people treat me. Mm. And number two... They'd be fairly unkind. Very unkind. And number two, if I didn't take that fight, what would Fury have to say about me? Mm. He'd be very unkind. Yeah, so I'm not going to stoop to that level. Mm. I respect everyone that steps into the ring. But I just, sometimes some people think to watch their mouths a bit. Would you be open to another three months of negotiations for a fight with Fury? It's what boxing needs. So, yes, I would be. 
It's what boxing needs. 100% I'll be open to it. And I think there's no better time. Even if Franklin kicks my ass, I'll still fight Fury. There's no better time than to get Fury in the ring now because he needs me to redeem himself from this circus, this letdown. He needs me, so there's no better time for him to call my name out. And I'm someone that will take on any challenge. This is what we're in, and I've got to give the fans what they want. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I would be up for it, 100%. So that's Steve Bunks in conversation with Anthony Joshua. Steve, the first thing I've got to say to you is this, that I've, I've seen numerous AJs during the course of this process. Press conferences, he's been quite, I wouldn't say aggressive, but he's been edgy, and he said one or two things that have made headlines. But when you sat down with him, that was AJ, nice and relaxed, ready to go to work very, very clear on what he wants to do and what he thinks about the situation. There's this multiple personalities operating around this fella. I think part of that is that I've been sitting down with him now since 2010, and that's an awful long time ago. And I sat down with him all through that fantastic amateur run, through the start of the professional career, through all of the wins, the easy wins, and through the difficult times. You know, I waited till three o'clock in the morning and basically hijacked him after he got knocked out by Andy Ruiz in a giant lift, surrounded by about 78 of his entourage, everyone glaring at me, and I got up to him and there was pin drop silence to talk to him about the first knockout he suffered, the first defeat as a pro, which had only been about three hours earlier. So it, that comes through years. Sometimes, Fletcher, I'll be absolutely honest with you, is I sit down with him and I get a lovely 12, 15 minutes and it plays out on Five Live, it's lovely. And then I'll see something on Twitter that night, which was something recorded 20 minutes after me. And as you say, it's a different person. He's edgy, confrontational. But then in all fairness, there's an awful lot of people ask him an awful lot, if you don't mind me saying so, an awful lot of silly questions. Sometimes, and I'm going to mention the word here, it's the A word, sometimes people have an agenda. And that makes him bristle. He's only a human being, Fletch. Were you like that, George? Were there layers to your personality at that point as you were getting the mind in the right place for what you've got to do come fight night? No, definitely. I think also he's conscious of what he says because he knows it's going, to get, it's going to get picked up and quoted. And he knows people are going to ask him about other fighters that he doesn't really want to probably want to talk about right now. He wants to talk about his fight with Franklin right now. They're going to ask him difficult questions that he might not necessarily know the exact answer to about how he's thinking, how he's feeling, how his training's gone. He might want to just lean back and go, can I just answer these after the fight, please? Or can you work it out for yourselves? But you can't do that before a fight. I don't think he's in the mindset of selling this fight. He's, he's, it seems very much business. I think he's switched on. He's, he's spent his camp away from home. That, you know, to me, paints the picture of a man who's just got focused on one thing, that is winning. Steve, one thing that stuck out to me, you asked him a question about how he puts the team together because he's working with Derek James this time, he's Rob McCracken, he's gone through trainers. So now he feels settled in what he's done. He's changed the way he's prepared for this fight. But he made the point that the penny kind of dropped in 2018. He said he watched Croatia in the World Cup and they were the underdogs and they were beating more established teams in that tournament. And it told him how he had to go through the process. If I'm being a cynic and playing devil's advocate, I would say to you, that why are we five years down the line and now he's saying he's happy with the situation? Why did it not happen quicker? You can imagine AJ, and, he, and, he, and you see AJ's mind working. He's thinking, OK, they've got, you'll use an American term, they've got an offence, they've got a defence coach, an offence coach, they've got a goalkeeping coach, they've got a guy that works on set pieces. That's five or six different elements. So he's thinking, hold on a minute, as good as Robert McCracken is and as good as the rest of that team are up in Sheffield, OK, they're terrific, but perhaps I need a specialist here. It doesn't come overnight, it doesn't happen overnight. The selection process for the trainers is a long process. Some of it is word of mouth, then he's got to work with them, he's got to try and gel with them like he did with Derek James. And like he did in all fairness with Robert Garcia last year, that just didn't work out. That happens, we're all big boys. So he was, in his mind, he's got an idea in the, in the late summer of 2018. It just takes a bit of a while to put it into place. It, 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 I'm not surprised it's taken that long because he actually, he's actually hired people who are now no longer involved, but he's picking up stuff. I think what he's done is he's reached that phase where he needs to, he's still, he's still learning, he's still learning different things, but he also needs to be reminded. And it reminds me of a quote, and if you want to put your feet up now, you can, because this quote takes 60 seconds to tell. It reminds me of something, there's lots of name dropping coming up. It reminds me of something that Angelo Dundee said to me when I was in Tokyo, when he was managing and looking after George Foreman. You were right. George, exactly, brother. <laughs> Angelo Dundee was ancient, George Foreman was ancient, and he was defending a version of the world title. And I said to Angelo, I said, 
Angela, how is it working trying to teach George? And the two of them just started laughing. They laughed for about 30 seconds. So I'm sitting with these two giants and they're laughing their head off at me. And I think, oh, I've made a right mistake here. So they looked at me, George looked at me, Angelo looked at me. And then George said, no, Angelo doesn't teach me anything. He just reminds me what I've forgotten. And it was a great quote and it was worth being laughed at by those two giants. And I think from talking to AJ, when he talks about Derek James, I get the feeling that Derek James is doing a little bit of that. He's reminding AJ of things he's done. He's telling him, that you're the man that can do this. You're the man that does this. So he's not trying to get AJ to throw a quadruple hook off the back foot, switch, go along the road. He's not trying to do that. He's just trying to fine tune him and remind him. And that's, it's a process, Fletch. It's an ongoing process. George, you've been there in exactly that situation, haven't you? When you split from Adam Booth, Paddy Fitzpatrick came in. And I remember you saying in the lead up to the Carl Froch fight, the first one, he's not here necessarily to train me, but he's here to kind of remind me exactly what Steve said. So you've followed that path. Well, sure, he's there to nudge, nudge me in the right direction. That's what it felt like. And um, I wasn't quite as old as George Foreman, so I didn't need to be reminded what no I forgot. as old as George Foreman. <laughs> but, um, but sure, I mean, when the first fight back, you know, you don't want to see wholesale changes. And um, just to go back and sort of work out why it can take five plus years to figure it out, then sure, I mean, it's a process for Joshua. It, in boxing, it's very difficult to have a lot of a, a big a big team of people who are actually participating in your sort of development or just preparing you for a fight because you ultimately you need the head coach who's like the manager because everyone has to go through him your strength coach you've got to check with the head coach because you he can't his stuff can't get That's in the, the way, way of be, yeah. stuff. your nutritionist he needs to speak to the head coach your your pr guy who's getting you these these uh million dollar deals to, but you've got to, go, to speak to that you got to go and stand on Oxford Street and smile for, for a day and a half when that's taking it out of your legs when you should be in the gym sparring so everything's got to go through that management usually a head coach usually someone who has that wisdom and in this modern age like it's not just the head coach who says just uh, eat drink the raw eggs in the morning mate and uh, the pep talk you know for the sports psychology is just go and just dig deep and, and, and don't give up there's a lot more to it, but so it's become complicated, but it still fundamentally has to go through that one man. Let's go inside the Anthony Joshua business, the Anthony Joshua camp. Let's bring in Andy Bell, who's been part of the management team from day one. So, I mean, you, Andy, have been every step of the way. Where is he mentally, physically, and in terms of, for want of a better phrase, having all the ducks in a row heading into this one? He's in a good place. He's in a really good place. I think training-wise, feels great. I think he's really gelling with the new man. I think he loved being out in the States. He's left alone. He can get on with his work. I think from a media point of view, it's as big as ever. You know, there's this lazy narrative that goes around that he is not the big draw anymore, which is just totally false. You know, I'm the guy who gets all the income in and it keeps going up and up and up, whether that's broadcasters asking what he's doing, national newspapers, magazines, documentary series, it's constant. And perhaps, you know, that noise in the past has been too loud. Maybe, perhaps. But for me, like, he's the same guy that I met back then. He's the same guy that's going into this one. Sure, there's a lot of pressure on this. He knows he's got to win, but I think he's going to do the business and the machine will roll on from Saturday night. Why do you think that is? Because it's sold out on Saturday. Um, yeah, despite a few other outlets saying right. they'd only done 15%. When it, when it barely sold, allegedly. Yeah, which is baffling, but yeah. either way. And we're all looking at it through the eyes of what might be next and we're all excited yeah, yeah. about that we see this as an AJ win and then we wonder what's going to be next for him with yeah. Derek James so we're all excited about that I think that's all I right think that's the way the boxing public see yeah. it in the United Kingdom but why do you think there would be this desire to almost do him down as he, as he makes this comeback I just think comeback? it's a really easy and lazy narrative I think a lot of our sport now is seen through YouTube you know I think the traditional media outlets still cover the sport but it's not, you know, the YouTube channels have exploded into life. And what do the YouTube channels require to, to get views? Clickbait. You know, and it's really easy to be like, this guy's finished. You know, I ask X, I ask Steve Bunce, is Anthony Joshua finished? Oh, well, he might be. Bunce, he goes in on AJ. That's you not know. true, by the way, but yeah, yeah, it's a I good mean, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I a, obviously, that was a for example. instance, Bunce. Yeah, 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 yeah. Clear this up for me as well, because sure. I'm watching this as a fan. And I'm seeing whether this is, whether this is exactly what you've just said. I'm seeing stuff where he says, if I lose on Saturday, I'm going to retire. I then listen to him sit down with Steve yeah, and yeah. say, even if I get bashed up, I'll fight Tyson Fury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is the actual you know truth? What? He actually expanded on that after the press conference. We had a chat. He's like, do you know what? Sometimes I just sit down. I know where these guys are trying to take me. 
are you going to retire if you lose? And it's just easier for me to go with the flow and say, yeah, cool, if that's what you want, then... Because if I say no, then what? Like, so yeah, okay, cool, I will retire. He's got no intention of retiring. He's a competitor. You know, let's be honest about it. He's made a lot of money through the sport. Uh, and not enough is made also about the amount that he does with that money. He put a huge amount of money back into grassroots boxing during the pandemic, and I mean huge, which got a bit of publicity at the time, but not a huge amount, you know, where other fighters say they're going to do things and they don't do it, and that doesn't get followed up on. I think for him, he just, in those situations, it's just easier to roll with it. That's actually true. And, and that might sound, you might, if you're listening, you're going, well, surely he doesn't say things he doesn't mean. Well, it's just, it's just, it's just, Basically, in old newspaper terms, it's tomorrow's chip paper. That's what news. That's what that you know. If you ever got into an argument with newspaper people, they would say, "Don't worry, Bunsy, just tell him it's tomorrow's chip paper." That'd be the editor on the phone. I go, "Okay, I'll tell him." So you call up someone and say, "That's tomorrow's chip paper." That didn't go down very well. And I thought, and I don't do get that impression with AJ. But when I, you know, when, and I would say this: when I sit down with him, I think we get somewhere to closer to where he sits and where he stands. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Bunsy. No, I think no, if, you've been, if you've been around him long enough, you can see when he's being really straight down the line. Absolutely. And I think he has more respect for some outlets than others, let's put it that way, and that maybe I shouldn't say that, but I think he knows the ones that will set agendas. So if he does sit down with Bunsy and, you know, there's a conversation, he knows that will reverberate out and he'll be, you know, very straight with it. Sorry, George. Sorry, is that new from Joshua, would you say? Because I've always, I've always thought he was a deep thinker, says everything on purpose, you know, that was always important to him. Whereas now, if he's saying something just for the simplicity, is that is that wise old head or is that just a, a yeah, different AJ? It's a really good question. I, th I think it is wise. I, th I think it is It's him learning how you get through these weeks. Because ultimately, as you know more than anybody else, it's what you do in the ring on Saturday night that matters. So it's just dealing with what's in front of him to move it aside, get back to focusing. He's still training this week as you would have been. He wants it done, dusted. Let's go and do what I do in the ring. And if I win, then the narrative just takes care of itself. It's as simple as that. I've got to say to the three of you as well, there is something romantic about preparing in the way that he's prepared for this fight. Oh, is there ever? We, we've all watched the Rocky films. We've all seen Ivan Drago in the high-tech gym running around the track. Rocky taken back to that gym by right. Apollo Rocky's in Los in, Angeles. Rocky's in the snow being chased by the KGB in, and doing the pull-ups in front of the fire. That was all true. So there is something romantic about the way he's gone about it, and you can't, you can't be surprised by the fact that that might really have turned him on in the build-up to this fight. I've never seen a, a picture of a man chopping wood so distributed. By the way, <laughs> with the gum shield in. With the gum shield in, I saw the same picture. That might be for splinters, I don't know. But I saw that too. Who cares? Listen, we've got AJ chopping wood, and if he doesn't chop wood, he doesn't get hot. And even though Dallas is a bit warm, let's imagine it was Chicago in his fourth worst snow. Who cares? That was perfect. And that was all part of the narrative. And, and that's the kind of guy Derek James is, remember? That, that, that's Derek James. Even if Derek James is not involved with AJ, we're having a conversation about bright, young American trainers. We're talking about Derek James. Andy, thanks for the insight. It's been great talking to you today. No we wish everybody well. Thank you. Tomorrow night, hope it goes well. Big things down the line. We're going to be with you every step of the way. That's Andy Bell, who's been part of the Anthony Joshua management team right from day one. OK, we've had a look at this from AJ's side of things. Let's hear from the other side of the argument. So, Jermaine, you were here last year for Dillian White. You are up in Morecambe. Today we're in a very fancy hotel. Uh, you're staying over on the island... Next thing you know, you'll be driving a cab around London, <laughs> brother. You, you, you know it well. Yeah, I'm starting to uh, starting to get my bearings here. So, yeah, I like it, though. It's like a, a second place for me to come be able to travel or bring my family or something over here. So, yeah. And you get treated well. Yes, I get treated lovely over here. It's, uh, it's kind of amazing. When we first got here like that, Sunday or Monday, we went to get something to eat. Um, guys had recognized me. They paid for our food, everything. Wow, so, that's yeah. good guy. Yeah. Now, obviously, Joshua is a, is a big national hero here. You know, he's an idol. But he's uh -huh. coming off the back of two defeats. Where do you think Joshua's head is? Where do, where do you think he is? Uh, I think he probably got his, his head in the game. You know, um, taking a defeat can, can have a huge toll on you. So, you know, as an athlete, um, I think when you take a defeat, it kind of gives me a little motivation. It makes me want to work harder, become better. So, you know, um, 
just from my personal opinion, I probably think that's where his headspace at. He want to come out a little. But, you know, um, I really can't speak for him because I don't know him that well. But, you know, my my headspace, I'm in a great space. Um, so even after losing to Dilly and losing yeah. the unbeaten record, you, you you didn't go into the dumps, lock yourself away for no, seven days, I'm, not talk to anybody? I'm very, I'm very tough mentally. Mentally, you can't break my will. You can't break my will. You can't take my heart. You'll have to kill me. So I would never, like, I, I come from a hard place kind of, so I would never put myself in a position to where I feel like nothing is possible. I can't do anything because I took a loss, you know. Um, every lesson is a great lesson, you know. And, um, it's just all about how you come back and what you do after that. And it's about how you come back and it's about how you do after that. Were you a Anthony Joshua fan? Had you watched his fights over the last oh, yeah, four I'm, or five I'm a fan years? Of boxing. Out of your eyes? I'm a fan of boxing, period. Um, I love the sport. Even way before we got this fight, I've been watching AJ fights. I've been watching Dylan fights, you know. Um, I'm just a fan of boxing. Boxing kind of um, took me to a different space in life, so... I've always been grateful and I always just I just like to watch it honestly even the boring fights I might go to sleep on it but I still turn it on yeah in in all fairness you know you talk about how you know where you came from and you know your career was progressing but there was no it didn't seem to be any great direction suddenly Uh in the space of six or seven months you've had Dillian White big fight Mm -hmm. now you've got AJ big fight okay you lost you lost to Dillian White nothing in the fight and you're going to obviously you're going to do your best against AJ could you have dreamed a year ago that you'd be in this situation? Um, a year ago, um, probably not here in this situation. But um, a year ago, I pictured myself chasing, chasing this, chasing, you are chasing. This, chasing this success. So, um, and a year, a year ago was a little rougher on me. You know, I uh, was working in a factory and stuff. I wasn't really, I didn't have the time to train or box like I wanted to. So. Um, a year ago, it was like always in the back of my mind that I would get there. I just didn't know how long it would take. And what sort of factory, if you don't mind me asking, not you know, not prior into your private life, what uh-huh. sort of factory are you working in? What sort of hours? Uh, it was like uh, this company called Duralast. They make commercial roofing. I was in the knitting department uh, making this knitting that goes in between two vinyl. Wow. And yeah. that was a year ago? Yeah. Well, that was Jermaine Franklin, and we will talk about him in a minute, Steve, but I've just bumped into Tony Bellew. Tony, Buncey's just been talking about this gym where AJ's been training, and you said it didn't smell particularly great, didn't look particularly great. Take us inside there, what was it like? A spit and sawdust sweating boxing gym. Uh, typical of what them gyms are like, so it's brilliant. It's a rocky-esque gym. You go in, spit, sawdust, smells a little bit of sweaty gloves, uh, and it's small and congested. When you go there and train in an environment like that, what else does it give you? Makes you horrible. Right. Make sure one of the air people. That's what it used to do to me. I go in them gyms and I just want to get stuck in. Whoever comes through them door, it's like fresh meat. The only difference is when Josh walked in, he's six foot seven or whatever he is, and he's a lot heavier and bigger than me and better looking. So, uh, but listen, he's fresh meat, and and he adapts, he he, he makes changes, and he got he gets the work done. That's what he's done in that gym. That gym will have reignited the fire in his belly. It really will. Be honest with me, then. How much do you think? he's got left and what do you think the future can still look like for him it's crazy you you say what what's left he's young still a young man in heavyweight terms and in the division Uh, you'll see just like till he starts exchanging leather as long as the punches are sharp and as long as he's accurate and just be AJ because if AJ turns up and he beats AJ he knocks people out that's what he does he's not facing the pound for pound best fight in the world anymore he's not facing a guy who's going to be elusive and you can't catch him you can't find him He's facing the guy who's going to be right in front of him and isn't going anywhere. I can't wait. Do you think people appreciate what he knows now based on those experiences? Because that, if if he has soaked it up like a sponge, Not, can make him significantly better. Nothing is more valuable than lived experience. And, that, and he has a lot of that now. So tomorrow night he just has to go out there and put on show that lived experience. Use it to your advantage. He doesn't need to take anyone else's accounts or anyone's opinions into consideration no more he just has to go out there and do what he does best and ultimately looking at AJ's record his pedigree and his history what he does best is knocking people out I think we see that again on Saturday night Tony great to talk to you thank you always a pleasure Fletch
I tell you what, Steve, you're exactly right about that gym, and it was fascinating to go inside it, essentially, with Tony. Yeah, because Tony likes that type of thing anyway. Oh, Tony's you can tell. Not a he's not a fancy man. He might wear fancy shoes. Men mention your shoes again, third <laughs> reference to shoes. He might wear fancy shoes and fancy clubber, but Tony, when he trains, is old school and old-fashioned. He's got a magnificent Arturo Gatti jacket, oh, on, which, which are a few hundred quid, I think, when you try and get them. If, but if, if it, anybody can carry it off, Bunsy, it's the yeah. bomber. Well, if anybody does carry it off, you're, you're the lead suspect if it vanishes. Uh, Fletch, listen, I'm going to try and bring in this guy here. He's, he's a little bit busy. He's getting over. This is, Fletch, let me introduce you to Dimitri Salita. Now, Dimitri Salita is not only one of my favourite people in boxing, he also works and promotes alongside Jermaine Franklin. He works with Jermaine Franklin. He didn't necessarily discover Jermaine Franklin. Uh, and thanks for joining us, Dimitri. We just heard from uh, Tony Bellew, who's been out in Derek James's gym in Dallas. Now, your slight reservations about this new relationship between trainer and boxer is that it's new, as opposed to the Jesse Addison relationship with Jermaine, with Jermaine, Jermaine Franklin. Is that, that There is a danger with a new trainer in the corner. There's definitely a danger. Anthony Joshua knows how to fight. He's an Olympic gold medalist, multi-time world champion, great fighter. The fact that he's been changing so many trainers so quickly, I do not think adds much value at, the, at this level of his career. I believe that with Anthony, who knows how to fight very well, it's more mental than physical. And um, if Jermaine can make it difficult for Anthony, the test will be how Joshua will react in the corner listening to Derrick James. My point was that when Jermaine listens to Jesse, he's gonna believe him. He's gonna get, whether it's cheerleading on or whether it's real actual instructions, he's gonna believe him. But uh, Derrick James and Anthony Joshua is a very new relationship and it takes time to build trust and belief. And uh, we'll see tomorrow night what it's all about. Demetri, is Jermaine coming back to London thinking I've got unfinished business? Because I watched the Dillian White fight and, and I'll be honest with you, I thought he nicked it. He's coming back now to fight Anthony Joshua and we know what the future would look like for him if he wins. Does he come back here thinking, listen, didn't go maybe how it should have gone last time and I'm here to show them exactly what I'm all about? No doubt about it. He's 20 pounds lighter, in great shape. He's mentally in a great state. And he's definitely here to score the upset. And I believe for Jermaine, the time could not be more perfect. Coming off that great fight against Dillian White, thousands of miles away from home, in this town, knowing that he can perform at the highest level and not coming back against an aging Joshua, so to say, and someone who is caught up in a crossroads. So Anthony is either gonna be filled with fire to um, show himself or filled with doubt. And we'll see what, what that's all about. I gotta say, the other thing that I'm questioned me a little bit is that usually there's a public workout yeah and there was none yesterday and that made me think well why not uh, that's interesting you should say that because it is every single big fight in fact George Groves is here George George had a public workout here before his Carl Frotz fight at Wembley and I was wondering that so what, what do you think is it just is it just because there was a train strike so we had a day off or what are you reading into it Dimitri because I love a conspiracy for you come on Dimitri deliver well I don't know I don't know if there's a conspiracy but certainly for a big fight like that, you want to get as much exposure as you can. It's unusual Did, for a big fight it, like this. It's really unusual, but until you mentioned it, I had them put one on one together and come up with three and a half because it is strange. It is weird. It you, is odd. Me personally, I, you know, I come from the United States. I'm a little bit jet lagged and I was happy because I could get a couple of oh, yeah. extra hours in because I fall asleep at three o'clock in the morning. So it was good for me. However, I, the question did pop in my mind. Dimitri, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. My theory, Bunsy, is it was Eddie Hearn on the grassy knoll. I think that's the conspiracy <laughs> I'm going down. Oh, I, lo I love it. We heard from Andy Bell earlier on with people talking, you know, Andy Bell talking about people that have got agendas, people that have got this type of stuff. Well, here we are. We know we've just launched a. Is a does AJ? Is there something wrong with AJ? Is that why he wouldn't work out in public? Let's kill that. Let's kill that dead now. That's absolute rubbish. There wasn't a public workout, and I'll tell you for why. It's really boring. There was a major train strike called for Thursday, so they moved the conference, which is always on a Thursday, to Wednesday. Wednesday's the day for the public workout, so they got rid of the public workout. So we had a blank Thursday. It was to do with the row strike, nothing to do with AJ's bad shoulder. Oh, did I say bad shoulder? I'm going to say I don't think George looks convinced by this. At all. Nah, no way. I'm not having that. I think Dimitri <laughs> Salida, he knows why there's a train strike. He knows. Joshua, stop is, it, it, all of you. is Joshua in the best shape of his life and he wants to keep it a secret? No, stop it, stop it, stop it. I'm going to say stop it. Let's take control of this. 
OK, listen, fellas, we're running out of time. We've not got a great deal of time left. We could talk about this all night, but I do just want to focus on tomorrow night and when that first bell rings. I think the majority of boxing fans in the UK, George, expect Anthony Joshua to do this quickly. They expect him to get through the job tomorrow and then we can all start to dream about what might be down the line. How do you see it? I think, yeah, I think for the casual fan, that'll be just what they'll, they'll just... Yeah, what they think. Um, the guys are a little bit more in tune. They might think this could be a stumbling block. It could be some some difference in AJ. But I think the guys who are really in tune will think yes, he needs to go out there and do a job, and he must have prepared diligently for it. Has he got to answer questions, Steve, that might be cascading around his own head when the first bell rings? Physically, this is AJ's fight. Physically, he's as good as he's going to be. Mentally, is that where the questions have to be answered in that first round? I think they need to be answered maybe a bit before that, Fletch. I think they probably need to be answered when he gets to the arena three hours before. When, how he feels. When Derek James starts putting the tape up to put the bandages on, when Derek James watches him strip down. And bear in mind, Derek James has never been there before with AJ. So he might not pick up on things. But Andy Bell, who we heard from earlier, he will. And if he sees some odd things with AJ, perhaps he'll tell Derek. So we, I think it's all about, I want to see that first sight of AJ when he comes out. When he came out against Andy Ruiz in New York, and this is not being an aftertime, I was ringside with Mike Costello, formerly of this parish. And when he came out, AJ, the first picture we saw on our screens at ringside was AJ coming out of the dressing room, standing there, George, and gulping in air. You know that, that thing where he's trying to take it all in? And no word of a lie, I said to Costello with my elbow, and he went to me like that, we said, what's going on here? We didn't mention it again until he got beat, so I'm not claiming I knew it was coming, but I didn't like what I saw. So we'll get a little look at what it looks like. Then once the first first bell sounds, then we'll see. And we'll see by just where AJ is, where his body is. If he's up, if he's about three or four inches up there, then we know he's a bit tense. If he's a bit relaxed, with his hands like this, we'll know we might see something vintage. He's always been an open book, really. And Absolutely. Absolutely. You can see, and sometimes he's been a little bit too happy in a build-up to a fight and sometimes definitely on the ring walk he's, he's just a little bit too calm too relaxed he's yes. touching gloves with everyone that's not Kissing the mind baby's frame baby's heads on the way out to fight Usyk for the first time George that's nuts and he can't be too nice he's got to be spiteful he's got to be aggressive he's got to be the old AJ he's got to go and take this fella to the cleaners that's got to be the mindset and that's been the narrative all the way through this to, to answer you tick 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 every single one of those assertions and I think we will see that and, and uh, funny enough I watched back the Usyk fight I watched it with Richie Woodall in my front room the other day no sound just the fight and we were amazed at how many times AJ just about got vicious let two punches go and then didn't do anything else and how and now Usyk every time retreated not back way back so we need to see that we need to see it being consistent if he does that against Jermaine Franklin this could go 12 rounds and what's more Jermaine makes it tricky if he fights like that, we've got to see a nasty, vicious AJ. And if you're listening to this and you say, oh, I don't want to see someone who's nasty and vicious, in that case, give it a miss, because that's what this business is all about. Yeah, I agree with Steve there. You want to see the second and third wave coming from Joshua, so he can't just get away with single shots. So, yeah, absolutely, George. You know, second and third wave in the heavyweight division, it can go an awful Microphone long way. Microphone check. Are we live? Yeah, Derek, we are, Derek. Derek we are Chisora's indeed. Derek just joined us. We're, okay, we're, what are we we're talking about here? We're live-ish. Are we talking about George doing a comeback? No, we're not talking <laughs> about what in Saudi. We're not talking about George doing a comeback in Saudi. We're talking about what AJ we want to see tomorrow when the first bell sounds, Derek, at the O2. What yeah. AJ do we want to see? The AJ I want to see is a guy, you know, in Saudi Arabia, in that 15 minutes clip, when he got upset, he picked up the bells, he chucked them out of the ring, uh, he went crazy. That's the AJ I want to nice see. Nice one, Dale, nice one. That's the AJ I want to see. I don't want to see this Eddie Hearn, Frank, uh, Frank Cunningham's Eddie, Eddie uh, which you call AJ. I want to see the Femi, the Nigerian boy, you know, coming, going crazy in the ring. That's what we want to see. We, you know, we, I'm tired of seeing uh, this... AJ, you know, uh, you know, smoke Safety first. Yeah, nice I don't want to see that. I want to see a fighting guy. Do you understand? I know, George, you're looking at me like that. Um, uh, do you think you'll see it? Do you no. think you'll see it from I don't Joshua? Know. I don't know. We won't. We but just hope. I hope we see it, but I want to see that. I want to see that craziness. Do you think he, because you, you were so good at performing in that craziness, do you think he can perform? in that craziness. He did it once with Dylan White, if you remember his first yeah. fight with Dylan White. When he it was went, personal, yeah, when it was yeah, nasty. It was personal, yeah. And right now, we want to see that guy. Even then, I can't, that wasn't quite as crazy as it felt like after that Usyk loss. You know, that felt like a big change for him. Do you, so you want to see more of that? Or do you think he's still there? 
Do you think that feeling will resonate with him on fight night? It's, it's still there. We want that out. We want that out. We want him to bring it out. We, we need that. You know, we've, we've seen this so uh, for Charade for the last 10 years. You know, very, very humble man fighting. But that's, that's done now. He needs to come out, bring the rawness out. I think the and, fans will enjoy it. And they will enjoy it. And also, bear in mind, Derek knew AJ from when he first walked in to the Finchley gym. When AJ, let's get this right, AJ had a tag on his ankle and AJ didn't know if he was going down the left road or the right road. Derek and I were in my BBC London studio once after AJ had been arrested. Do you remember, Del? And we were worried that that was it. We might never see him again. He's come back from that. He plugs into the old AJ. He finds that old mindset with a little bit of the stuff he's naturally learned. I think we, I think we could see, and it'd be great to see, the best AJ we've seen, Del. If we saw that, AJ, then we're back in business, brother. Yes, we're back in business, but people, you know, people want rawness now. People don't want the whole glamorous, sugar-coated. They want the real, the realness. That's why human beings want now, and we're going to try and get that. Derek, brilliant. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Fantastic. That's Derek Chisora. George, very quickly, how does it finish tomorrow? I think, I think, hadn't thought about the craziness um, there from um, <laughs> Derek Chisora. I tell I you what, there's, say, a, there's a man who can bring the craziness. Let's not worry about He looks about in that. good shape. I don't, I don't think we'll see that from Joshua tomorrow. I think he would have... I think it's a subdued way about him that he's waiting to explode on fight night, but he'll be exploding with what he is, and that is pretty much a controlled fight. He's been, he's been a controlled fighter for his whole career. I think that's what works for him. I think definitely with his spite and viciousness, but I can see it more controlled. Listen, he, he, I agree, George. He has become a controlled fighter. We've only seen snippets of the AJ that we want to see, but I was up close and personal. I was holding the rope when he climbed out of the ring in Saudi Arabia. I saw that anger. I saw that venom. I saw his eyes bright with fury, absolute fury. And I think that Dell. I think it's going to be somewhere between what Dell says and what you say. I think we might see a continuation of that man at the, at the last bell in Saudi. I'm not saying this will be round 13 of that particular fight, but I think we might see, I think we might see a very forceful, because that's also Derek James' style, Fletch. Yeah. He's an aggressive trainer. It's been fantastic. We've reached the end of the road tonight. But tomorrow night, it might be the start of another journey back to the top of the heavyweight division for Anthony Joshua. George, been brilliant having you on the programme tonight. Thanks for joining us. Bunsey's going to lead our coverage tomorrow night, 10 o'clock, from the O2 Arena, live on Five Live. Anthony Joshua against Jermaine Franklin. You won't get coverage any better than you will get on Five Live. Thanks to all the guests on the Friday Football Social. Thanks for your company tonight. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Joshua Franklin, live on Five Live Sport. <laughs>